We've been working through a series in the book of Luke. Jesus is he's casting out demons. I don't know if that's made anyone feel uncomfortable, any modern people. He's rebuking fevers at people's bedsides. He's demonstrating his authority, and he will continue in these upcoming chapters, his authority over the created order, over this entire earth. And part of the effect that Luke wants us to see is that no one rivals Jesus. There's no one paralleling the authority and awesomeness and power of Jesus. How are we going to respond? Will we be dull in our ears? Will we say, oh, it was just another legend, another story? Or, as we will see in this passage, will we collapse, fall down, wonder at who this God is? We're going to read this morning out of Luke chapter 5, the first 11 verses where Jesus begins to encounter his first disciples. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn there. It might be helpful through the sermon just to have your eyes upon the Scripture, but the words will be on the screen as well. Let's turn our attention to the reading of God's Word, Luke 5, 1 to 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the Word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, some sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord given for our church, and it's given for our good. Pray with me today. Father, we thank you for your word. It's no small thing, and we desperately need it. So open our ears, open our hearts, speak to us today, help your servant to speak humbly and confidently, to get out of the way that your word that brings the dead to life might be operative in our hearts today. Save the lost, encourage the found. Speak to us, we pray, O Lord, in Christ's name, amen. I want to ask you this morning, it's a question that you've probably thought about at least a little bit if you've been in the church for some time, but what do you think it means to be a disciple of Jesus? For the amount of people in this room, I imagine there's some lengthy answers, there's some different answers, but let me give one response of what one person gave an answer uh, to a question like this, And, and here's what he said. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self. I've come to kill it. No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self. All the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones that you think are wicked. The whole outfit. And I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own shall become yours. I don't know if that's a familiar quote to anybody. That was C.S. Lewis um, from one of, his, one of his greater works in Mere Christianity. And I think it's a good way to approach this question of what what does it mean to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus? And my guess is for a lot of people who've grown up in the church and maybe some of us here this morning, that might be a different way 
of answering how some of us feel to answer the question. You know, you serve a little bit in the church, give a little bit of my quiet time daily to Jesus, attend church on Sundays, a little bit here and there, I'm going to follow after him. This quote here is saying something profoundly different. It's saying, give me all. In this scene that we just read a few moments ago, Jesus, he's coming to Peter and he's saying, Peter, I, I want you. I want all of you. And he gets into the boat, into the center of Peter's life, which I think is indicative and it's representative to how Jesus comes down into our world, how he comes down into the center of our lives, into our world of sin and misery. And he calls us, he summons us, he says, I want you, I want all of you. And as we explore this this morning of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus, there's a few things I believe we see in this passage of what it means to be encouraged to be a disciple. Or if not yet today, if you're here and these words seem far from you and you wouldn't profess to be a Christian, maybe to help understand you, uh, know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Here's the first thing I believe we see in this passage. To be a disciple of Jesus, to grow as a disciple of Jesus, means to surrender to His Word. It means to surrender to His divine Word. The, the setting of this, these 11 verses are found in verse 1 and 3, uh, verses 1 through 3. And this time... This time there's no synagogue, they're not in a religious environment of learned scribes and Pharisees. No, this time the scene takes place at the Sea of Galilee, 13 miles by 7 miles. And the scene that we gather, if you were paying close enough attention, is worn out fishermen, weary fishermen. They're, they're mending their nets, they're cleaning and fixing up their nets after a long, unfruitful night of catching no fish. This is their profession, their business. Out all night, catching nothing. And Jesus comes on the scene and he commands a boat. He commandeers a boat. It's Peter's boat. Maybe you're wondering, why does he need a boat to teach the people? But it was well known at that time that to speak from the sea to the shore in Galilee, which was not an altogether uncommon thing, created this uh, Amphitheater, amphitheater setting that as one would speak, it would be um, enunciated far and wide. And so Jesus here, he's teaching from the sea to the shore. See the setting, Jesus teaching, worn out fishermen, Peter tired at the end of himself. And we're going to see he does exactly what Jesus asks of him. Now, I think it's helpful to remember that Peter is, is not altogether foreign or to, to who Jesus is. He knows Jesus because just a few scriptures earlier, he saw his mother-in-law's fever rebuked in a moment. Jesus comes into this private setting and he speaks a word. And Peter was there for that. And so what's swirling around, my guess, and if I had to speculate in Peter's mind, is that he knew that Jesus had some kind of divine power, that he was rebuking demons and casting out the sick. Peter knew this. He was well acquainted with it. But where our scripture takes a turn is Jesus, in verse 4, he makes this preposterous command. Jesus says the absurd, or seemingly, to the people on that day. And he says, in verse 4, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a, uh, for a cast to catch fish. Now, I don't know how many fishermen are here in this room. I like to believe that I'm a, a little bit of one, but I know there's some who fish more than me. But fishermen, as you knew, especially in that day, that you fish at night, not in the daylight. Also, you fish along the shore, especially in Galilee. It was known that you don't go out in the deep in the noonday sun and presume that you are going to catch any fish. And so the rumors or the murmuring of what would have been, how people would have responded to Jesus' word would have been something like, who is this man from the hill country? Who's this man of Nazareth, a carpenter's son? This guy, has, this guy doesn't know anything about what it means to catch fish. I'm, I'm guessing that this is how they were thinking. 
They were murmuring amongst themselves, what is this man talking about? No one goes fishing in the day, in the deep, after a long, uh, unsuccessful night. His command is preposterous, but Jesus' word is powerful. And so Peter, in knowing a bit about Jesus, he responds and he says, Master, boss, chief. You can see him here probably with some reluctance in his voice. And he says to Jesus, we've toiled, Jesus. We're, we're essentially, we're weary. We were out all night and we took nothing But hear Peter's response. He says, but at your word, at your word, Jesus, this sounds, this doesn't sound like this is going to work here, but something connected with Peter about what he saw with his mother-in-law, what was happening around Galilee, where Peter basically is saying, I don't think this is going to work, but I think it's worth giving a shot. There's something unique about Jesus. There's something about his word that we're going to let down these nets and see what is going to happen. And from there, the miraculous happens. Verse verse 6 begins to tell us that a swarm of fish come by the boats. The nets begin to break. The ropes are snapping. The boats are sinking. This is the best day of Peter's professional life as a fisherman. It would have been something extraordinary to see the look on their faces, the swarms of fish coming in, this would have been something to witness. And how does Peter respond? Well, as these boats begin to sink, so does Peter. Peter, at Jesus' word, sees this miracle and he collapses. He falls down at his knees. He collides with the authority of an awesomeness of Jesus. Something happens in the heart of Peter that day where he falls prostrate before God on on this boat. (coughs) Excuse me. And it teaches us here that following Jesus, that seeing Jesus at his word summons us to a life of surrender. It calls us to fall down before him, to collapse at the very word of Jesus. In fact, in verse 9 and 10, we read that all were astonished. You see, when Jesus performs these miracles, when Jesus does things that no one else can do, when Jesus performs the the miraculous, the right response is this kind of terrified amazement. It's this response that he has all the power, that he rules the world, that Jesus is in control here. This is what Luke wants us to see in a passage like this. There's someone greater than myself. There's someone who is holy and amazing and powerful. We couldn't have done this. We were fishing all night long, but at one word of Jesus. You see, the current law of our land, the world that our children grow up, the world that we live in is... This message of find your own truth, live your own truth, find harmony within your own voice and your own truth is what is objective. Follow after that word. Am I wrong? But Peter here in the boat, he hears the voice of a man and the right response is to say, there is a word outside of myself. There is a greater truth, a greater authority and it requires full surrender to him. His word is true. I'm going to ask you this morning, I don't know if this has been years ago or recently, when you open God's Word, when you see God do mighty things, do you fall before Him? Have you come to terms with the authority of Jesus in your life? Have you collapsed in surrender to Him? Oh, in weakness, in times where it is a sheer fight against your pride, but are you surrendered to God's Word even in the midst of absurdity, when it seems like it is a reckless move, it seems like God's word is colliding with the culture and Jesus' word seems so far from where we need to be. Do you surrender? Do you trust? Do you say at your word? At your word, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to surrender to you. 
There are times when Jesus' command will seem preposterous, difficult, colliding with our ideals and the priorities of our lives. And yet we see a reminder through this passage through Peter to fall down on our knees before Jesus because he has the words of life. I don't know if you remember in John chapter 6, but John 6 was a, a passage in Scripture where Jesus was saying some hard words. He was talking about himself being the bread of life. And he said to his disciples and the onlookers, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And they said, Jesus, a lot, a lot of what you've been doing, paraphrase, a lot of what you've been doing and saying has seemed wonderful and true, and I've been a follower of you, but I think you've taken things too far here. And many disciples left him that day, and Jesus turns to Peter and said, Peter, will you leave as well? And Peter's response, the same Peter who obeyed Jesus at his word in the boat, months later in his life, says, Jesus, where am I to go? Your words are the words of life. I may not understand everything you say, but when you speak, we come to life. When you speak, you raise the dead. When you speak, you have authority over all. There's nowhere else to turn, Jesus. You have the words of life. And so this is our, our, our first point that we see in this passage. Jesus does a wonderful miracle, and the summon is to respond in surrender. But we also see not just surrender, but there is a call to see our own sinfulness. It's alike. They're in the same family here, but we see this unfolding more in Peter's language in verse 8. Look with me at verse 8. Peter falls down. He falls at the knees of Jesus. And then he says these words. Depart from me, Jesus, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What's happening in Peter's life at, the, at this moment, I believe, is that he sees the splendor, the holiness, the greatness of Jesus. And when he sees that, he has a profound sense of the sin in his life. He sees the greatness of Jesus. He sees him for who he truly is. But also within that, he begins to see the pervasiveness of sin in his own heart. His response in the face of God's holiness is, I need to get off of this boat. I don't belong here. This is the response through its scripture. Friends, that when people see the majesty of Jesus, you so quickly become acquainted with your own sinfulness. Think about Jacob when he wrestles the angel all night long and his life is changed when his hip is thrown out of joint he walks differently for the, his entire life because he's encountered God think about Isaiah in chapter 6 he's in the throne room of God and all of a sudden he says woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips amongst unclean people profound sense of his own sin Job as he comes face to face with his God recognizes the depth and the pervasiveness of sin in his own heart. This is the kind of experience that is fitting when we see God for who he truly is. You've heard the expression, or maybe, maybe you have, where someone says, I've encountered God at the end of my dock at my cottage, and it was wonderful, this profound sense of warmth and feeling, and God is creator. I don't want to belittle that. That's absolutely, there, there's the truth of us knowing who God is through His creation and world. But it seems throughout Scripture that when you come face to face with God, you sense a deep trouble. You, feel, you fall into a dire situation. You wonder, how am I going to survive? What must I do? God, get away from me. Depart from me, for I am an unclean man. You see, what it means to follow Jesus is to know that we are good at sinning, that we are a sinful people. And yet, the truth of the gospel and the truth of the Christian story is even despite that, and the way we see Jesus coming to Peter is that he loves us, he pursues us, he wants to redeem us and call us his own. This is th this story of Peter feeling unsuitable to be called by Jesus was precisely the moment that was preparing him to be an apostle, to, to, to minister for Jesus' kingdom. I heard a story 
not too long ago of uh, a man named Bobby Moore. Bobby Moore was the captain of the English national team in 1966 when Eng- England won um, when, when England won the cup. And one of the, I guess, traditions in England is that when they won the cup, Bobby Moore knew that he would be ascending the, the platform to shake Queen Elizabeth's hand and to receive the trophy. But there was this terror that is documented about Bobby Moore because he was covered in mud from the pitch. And he knew that in a few moments' time, he was about to approach the queen wearing white gloves. Here's a man covered in mud from the pitch about to ascend these stairs to meet the Queen of England, prim and proper, covered in, or wearing white gloves, all in white. And so as he, as he ascends these stairs, he's wiping off his hands, he's seeking to clean himself, however means necessary to try to get himself clean before he comes into the presence of royalty. And so often, this is how we are before God. We act like Bobby Moore, trying to clean ourselves up in our own sinfulness as we're coming in to the presence of royalty. We try to get our lives right. We try to be moral. We try to clean ourselves up from our imperfections and failures. But as we see our own sinfulness and knowing the gospel, Jesus comes to us in our mess, in our filth, saying, come as you are and I will clean you. I will wash you. I will make you new to come into my presence. This is what is so different about the gospel and the Christian life than anything else. You're inadequate. You can't clean yourself up. You can't wash yourself from your sin. You can't make yourself morally ready to be with God. This is a work that only he can do. Peter says, get away from me, Jesus. I, need to, I either need to get off this boat or you need to leave. But Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. I think in a sense he is saying, you are mine. Peter, I'm redeeming you. I'm calling you. I've come into this world to cleanse sinners like you, Peter. You know, what's interesting in the story of the Gospels is there is a bookended, almost exact story at the end of John. John 21 After the resurrection, Jesus' disciples, including Peter, they're out fishing all night and they catch nothing. And Jesus on the shore, he comes to them. And this time, Peter's response isn't one of saying, Lord, depart from me. It says that he jumps out of the boat and runs to Jesus. You almost get this profound picture of the change in Peter's heart where he says, Woe am I, Lord, away from me. I am a sinner. And yet spending three years with Jesus, after denying him before he goes to the cross, Peter's response is to jump off the boat to run to Jesus. Profound maturity and growth and understanding of who this Savior is in his life. And maybe I could ask you this morning, in your failure and in your sin, the times where you feel filthy and unworthy to come to Jesus, do you run away from him or do you run to him? Do you run to His grace in your sinfulness and failure when you recognize the depth of sin in your own heart? Do you run to Him knowing that His grace and His mercy is more than we could ever ask for? Do you sit, condemn yourself, think your sin's too great, the grace of God too small? You see through the progression of Peter's life, knowing this great high priest, this great Savior, this one who had taught him for three years, would surely be the one who could clean Peter, who would be sufficient for his sins. So we see through this passage that we are to surrender at God's word. That as we see God for who he truly is, that there's a kind of understanding of the pervasiveness of our own sin, but also the beauty of Jesus' grace, that he is in the boat with us. Lastly, let me conclude. that He gives them a new call, a new vocation, that there is a response from Peter to submit to Jesus' call for his life. Look at verse 10 again. Jesus says to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. Peter is trembling, and Jesus says, Calm down. Don't fear. I'm calling you, Peter. And he goes on to say, From now on you will be catching men. 
men. And these three words here are the words that would orient Peter and the rest, and the rest of the disciples' lives forever, from now on. From, from now on, Peter, I'm giving you a new call. From now on, things are not going to be the same. From now on, there is going to be a great reversal in your life that only I can bring. Dramatic change happens to Peter, but a dramatic change happens in our life as well when you and I meet Jesus. He says to you and me, from now on, your life is going to look different. From now on, when I've called you into my kingdom, into my family, I've redeemed you from your sin, your life is going to look dramatically different. Not just a few things. Not a little more time or a little more money or a bit of a change at work. Like we read in the quote at the beginning, Jesus is saying, you are mine. I want all of you. You see, when you see the one who calls you and commissions us by his word, the priorities of our lives begin to change. And we see it on that day because it says they left everything and followed Jesus. You know, Peter walked away from his best day of business that he's ever had as a fisherman. The best profit he had ever made as a fisherman. He he leaves it all behind on that day. And I think the reason is this is that he knew that following Jesus meant looking at the estimated value of this world and seeing the glorious value of Jesus and said, I'll go with Jesus. I'll take all that Jesus can offer to me. I want to be with him. And this grace and glory is what trumped all the desire for greed, all the desire to live for his own kingdom. Peter left everything And followed after Jesus. Can I ask you today, what is Jesus worth to you? What is he worth? This passage here that Luke is telling us, he is worth it all. He is worth more than a casual glance every Sunday, a little time here and there. He is worthy of our lives. I'll be the first here in this room to to confess how guilty I am of not giving Jesus of what he is worth in my life. And more and more it's a call to stand underneath the cross, to draw near to his great grace, to recognize that without him I am nothing. Let me conclude with this today. What might this look like practically for our lives? Hopefully one of the imperatives that you're taking away isn't to quit your job today and Move into a monastery or to follow, to think that following Jesus means to leave all that you, you know, all you are, your profession, that that's what piety looks like. Not necessarily. Let me offer a few things. I believe it looks like this that we become preoccupied with what Jesus says over what we think. Part of the thrust of this passage is Jesus saying that the work of his kingdom is impossible but for his word. I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to go and make disciples. You're going to do kingdom work, and it's going to be impossible. But that's precisely the point. I want you to follow me. I want you to cast your net into the deep in the impossible situations of life because I want you to turn to me in faith. I want you to trust me. I want you to lean on me. Crestwood Church, are we living lives? The kind of dependence where we say, God, if your word doesn't come through in our lives... This particular sin that I'm dealing with, this calling that you've, you've brought me to and I feel lost, these many imperatives of the scripture that just seem so difficult, impossible. But at your word, by your grace, through your spirit, I'm going to trust you. Becoming preoccupied with what Jesus says over what we think is true. It also means to become preoccupied with what Jesus loves rather than what we prefer. How our prayer might be to, Lord, turn my affections from the cares of this world. That you would be preeminent in my lives, in my life. That's not to say that we are removed from this world. But you and I know how quickly our heart clings to the greed, the lust, the selfishness of this world. And to follow To leave everything to follow Jesus means that, Lord, change my heart that we love what you love and we hate what you hate. 
We're preoccupied with your kingdom. We're preoccupied, preoccupied with the things that you care about. And we become preoccupied with the worth of Jesus over the value of this world. Think about these disciples. Think about these fishermen who left everything that day not knowing what the future held. And that yet they knew that to surrender to Jesus, to submit to this gracious call, was the wisest thing that these men could do. How I pray in the days it would be true of us in our weakness, in our failures, that we would say, Jesus, where you go, we will follow after you. Pray this would be true of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, at your word, we often, we justify, we become defensive, we ask for reasons, and really what that shows in our hearts is we want control, we don't always want to trust your word, or we're, fe- we're fearful of what trusting your word might mean to us. Yet we thank you for this example of Peter collapsing at your feet, God in the boat with him. We thank you that God You are close to us and that we might live lives that are prioritized around your kingdom, whatever it may mean for our lives. And even as we come to the table now, remind us of your great love for us. Remind us that though we have sinned and fallen short of your glory, that you've came close to us in Jesus Christ. You've cleansed us. You've washed us. You've made us your own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.